Welcome to the 2014 Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare Learning Module titled Making Successful Mental Health Referrals for Refugee Families, Rights, Barriers, and Resources. Participants who complete this learning module will be able to understand the prevalence of psychiatric symptoms in new refugee populations, understand how to successfully refer refugees for mental health services, describe the barriers to successful referrals, and advocate for the healthcare rights of clients who have limited English proficiency. Please take a moment to review this overview of this learning module. Part one, what are the mental health needs of refugees? Minnesota's recent refugee populations have reported experiences of torture in their home countries. Research indicates that people who have experienced torture and trauma have an increased likelihood of suffering from negative psychological symptoms. These are clients that child welfare workers may find are in need of a mental health referral. Historical research estimates that up to 35% of refugees are torture survivors. Prevalence of torture may be even higher in some groups. Recent research with refugee populations found that 56% of Iraqis, 55% of Oromos, 36% of Somalis, and 30% of Karen refugees from Burma experienced torture. Additionally, war trauma affects a greater percentage of people. Whole communities of people have experienced war trauma, such as political oppression, forced displacement, forced labor, burning of homes and villages, exposure to dead bodies, and bombings. Refugees may be affected by physical injuries that could be due to dangers in flight, the refugee camp, torture, or ethnic violence. Some of these injuries may include back and neck pain, eye problems, head injuries or head traumas, headaches and stomach problems due to beatings, seizure disorders, sexual pain and dysfunction, injuries or amputations, chronic pain, including all over body pain, HIV, diabetes, hypertension, and other diseases. Child welfare workers may find that refugee clients are in need of advocacy or assistance to access medical services to resolve physical suffering, which may be affecting their ability to function, fulfill their family roles, or meet resettlement outcomes. Refugees who have survived torture and war trauma may be more likely to develop negative psychological symptoms. A recent meta-analysis of over 80,000 refugees found PTSD and depression rates close to 30%. Other potential effects of experiencing torture and war trauma include anxiety, trouble sleeping, difficulty concentrating, and somatic disorders that could include headaches, stomach aches, or all over body pain. All of these symptoms can interfere with functioning and can impair someone's ability to resettle successfully. The next two slides focus on two of the most common and serious disorders reported by populations who have experienced trauma, PTSD and major depressive disorder, commonly referred to as depression. This is a brief summary of the primary symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. There are four categories of symptoms. The first is re-experiencing the trauma. This could include nightmares, flashbacks, reactions to being reminded of the trauma, such as breaking out in a sweat or having a rapid heartbeat. The second category is avoidance. This is avoidance of things that remind someone of the traumatic experience, such as avoiding people, places, thoughts, or feelings that remind one of the trauma. The third category is negative alterations in thinking or mood as a result of the trauma. This could include negative beliefs about oneself or the world. For example, beliefs like, I am bad, or the world is completely dangerous. 
This category also includes persistently blaming oneself or others, or experiencing persistent negative emotions such as fear, horror, anger, guilt, or shame. The fourth criteria is alterations in arousal and reactivity. This could include irritable or aggressive behavior, self-destructive or reckless behavior, hypervigilance, having an exaggerated startle response or being easily startled, having problems in concentration, and sleep disturbance. Symptoms of major depression are listed on this slide and generally occur most of the day for nearly every day. These include depressed mood, markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities, significant weight loss, weight gain, or change in appetite, sleeping too much or sleeping too little, such as insomnia, psychomotor agitation or retardation, such as being keyed up or slowed down, fatigue or loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness or excessive and inappropriate guilt, diminished ability to think, concentrate, or make decisions, and finally, recurrent thoughts of death or recurrent suicidal ideation. Longitudinal research suggests that the negative effects of trauma can be long-term and enduring. An example of the long-term effects of trauma is a 2005 study of Cambodian refugees by Marshall and colleagues. The study included Cambodian refugees and was done 20 years after their resettlement. It found high rates of PTSD and depression. It is crucial for child welfare workers to be aware of refugees on your caseload because they may be struggling with mental health symptoms related to trauma or resettlement stress that may be impacting their well-being and functioning and be creating conflict or stress in the family. The next sections of this learning module describe healthcare resources for refugees and how to successfully refer refugees for mental health services. Part two, what healthcare resources are available to refugees? This section provides information that you may need to know if you are trying to connect a refugee to mental health services. All refugees receive at least eight months of medical assistance. They are also eligible for ongoing medical assistance based on income. Prepaid medical assistance programs, or PMAPs, are Minnesota's Medicaid programs that serve low-income adults, families, children, and pregnant women. Refugees who receive medical assistance are, are assigned to one of these PMAPs. There are different PMAP options depending on the county where someone lives. For example, in Hennepin County, the PMAP options are Hennepin Health, Health Partners, Medica, and UCARE. In Ramsey County, the PMAP options are Blue Plus, Health Partners, and UCARE. This slide also includes a link where you can find all of the health care plan choices by county in the state of Minnesota. PMAP plans provide assistance to their members to access health and mental health care within their networks. A quick way to access these resources is to check the back of a client's health insurance card. If there is a phone number listed for behavioral health, this is the number you would call for assistance with mental health referrals. You can also call the customer service number for assistance with mental health or other health care referrals. Additionally, some people who have chronic or more severe health conditions may already have someone assigned through their health plan, such as a health care navigator, who can assist them in managing their health needs. This would be another excellent resource for assisting clients to access mental health services. Professional interpreters and other language assistants are important for refugees who do not speak fluent English. According to Chen and colleagues, language assistance services are central to access and quality of care for limited English proficient patients. Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 
protects people from unlawful discrimination based on race, color, or national origin in programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance. This law states, recipients of federal financial assistance must take reasonable steps to ensure meaningful access to their programs, services, and activities by eligible limited English proficient persons. This means that healthcare providers who accept Medicaid, Medicare, or other federal funding may need to provide language assistance services such as interpreters or translated materials and may not deny or delay services to a person based on language. The Supreme Court has treated discrimination based on language as equivalent to national origin discrimination. If you feel a client or family you are working with who is limited English proficient has been discriminated against, you may file a civil rights complaint within 180 days of the occurrence. This link provides information about how to file a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights. In addition, you can find more information about language rights in healthcare by clicking on this link. Part 3, How to Make Successful Mental Health Referrals for Refugees. In this section, we present the results of an evaluation of the mental health service delivery system for refugees, including what factors contribute to successful and unsuccessful referrals of refugees for mental health services. The mental health system evaluation described in this section was done in response to the fact that a lack of mental health resources was identified as a reason for not screening the mental health needs of newly arriving refugees. Using a community-based participatory research approach, this project was developed to engage a steering committee of key stakeholders to evaluate the mental health referral system for refugees from the perspectives of providers who are working with refugees, primary insurance-based network providers, and also refugee community leaders. The role of the steering committee was to inform the interview protocol and study design, to identify participants who are meaningfully involved with the system, and to help interpret findings and recommend system interventions. The study utilized a critical incident technique, which is a data-driven way to investigate unknown domains. In this case, we were interested in identifying what makes mental health referrals for refugees successful and unsuccessful. The survey asked participants to think of a time when they successfully or unsuccessfully referred a refugee for mental health services. It asked them to briefly describe the person for whom they were making the referral. It also asked participants to describe in detail the steps that were taken in the referral process. In other words, what happened when the referral was made. Lastly, it asked participants to describe why they thought the referral was successful or unsuccessful. Survey respondents represent the perspectives of a wide variety of service providers who work with newly arriving refugees. Please take a moment to review this slide. These are the many different refugee populations that are represented in the data that we collected. This slide shows the four categories and 17 subcategories that describe factors that contribute to successful referrals of refugees for mental health services. These are the important things that make referrals successful. When you make a referral of a refugee for mental health services, you may need to play an active role in coordinating the referral throughout the process. Second, trust between the caseworker and client is a key factor in successful referrals. Third, when you make a referral, it is necessary to ensure the system responds. It is not enough to hand someone a piece of paper with referral information. Follow-up is necessary. 
Finally, culturally responsive care is important for successful referrals. Please take a minute to review the bullet points for what we are about to discuss. You may pause this presentation and take as much time as you need. When you're trying to refer a refugee for mental health services, it takes more coordination, especially if the person is newer to the U.S., still getting familiar with Western systems, and are not proficient in English. There needs to be active coordination and assistance with making the connection to mental health services. This is especially true if an interpreter and transportation are needed. Important steps in the active coordination of care include making a mental health referral, scheduling the mental health appointment by calling the agency, when providers share case files as appropriate, phone consultation between providers including the one making and receiving the referral, providing case-specific education and taking the time to discuss the needed service, and the referring and receiving providers staying in contact throughout the process. When there is a relationship between the referring party and the provider who's receiving the referral, and when there is open and ongoing conversation, referrals are more successful. This is a quote from a care coordinator who is facilitating a successful referral from a primary care doctor to a mental health provider. As a child welfare worker, you may need to follow the same steps depending on the situation and the needs of the family that you're working with. Please take a moment to read this quote. Taking this type of active role may not be what you ordinarily do, but again, for non-English speaking clients who are newer to the U.S., this type of active coordination of care may be necessary in order for the family to receive the services that they need. Next, we will discuss the role of trust. Please take a moment to review the bullet points under the category of trust. Because refugees from areas of conflict can have difficulty trusting authorities, it is important to take time to build trust and rapport with a refugee family. Your referrals will be more successful if you do take this time to learn about the family and to establish trust. The presence of a trusting relationship with the client impacts the success of referrals. Once you have established trust with a family and are able to identify their needs, you create opportunities for coordination of care with other service providers to whom you are able to help facilitate a referral. For more information on Somali culture to help you with the process of establishing trust, this slide includes a hyperlink to the Bridging Refugee Youth and Children's Services homepage for service providers who are working with Somali families. Ethnomed is another great resource that contains information on Somali history, culture, and medical needs. Please take a few minutes to review the resources that are available at these websites. You may pause this learning module as you do this. These are quotes that illustrate the concept of trust. The first quote is an example of a shelter advocate who utilized her alliance with a family to create an opportunity for care coordination. In this instance, the shelter advocate personally introduced the client that she was working with to the therapist, which made the client feel more comfortable. This is an example of how you can utilize your alliance with a family to help them connect to mental health and other services. In this second quote, a mental health provider who was referring a refugee family for mental health services described his process of building trust with the family. This involved taking plenty of time to reach common understanding, making a personalized relationship between the client and the provider, accompanying the client to the doctor appointment. All this ensured that the client felt understood, validated, and protected. The third category is the system responding to the needs of refugees. 
What's included in this category is what is necessary to help refugees connect and overcome access barriers. Child welfare workers may need to proactively identify potential access barriers and assist the refugee to resolve those system barriers. This could include providing or utilizing assistance from a health plan care navigator to assist with the following steps. Ensuring appropriate interpretation services are arranged for the mental health appointment. Communicating with the client through a professional interpreter. Ensuring clients have transportation to mental health appointments. Following up with a client beyond the initial referral. Provide education and information to clients about the process of accessing mental health services, including the benefits of utilizing mental health services, differences between Western and cultural mental health concepts, roles of different health professionals, and health insurance coverage of mental health costs. This is an example of successful system navigation. The client was agreeable to trying individual therapy with an interpreter which I explained is covered by her health insurance plan. I then called the clinic and set up the first appointment. I ensured that the client had transportation. I explained to the client the process for seeing therapy. I let her know that if she does not feel a connection with this therapist, we can find her someone else instead. I called the client after the first appointment and she informed me that she liked the therapist and plans to continue seeing this therapist. This quote is by a healthcare navigator who works for a health plan. Remember that refugees are covered by healthcare plans and each healthcare plan has a navigator that can help you with ensuring that these steps are taken. Again, call the number on the back of the health insurance card and explain that you are trying to help a member connect to mental health services. The fourth category that contributes to successful referrals is culturally responsive care. Taking the time to offer culturally responsive care may take more time and may require you to provide assistance with other things, like filling out forms, but it will pay off in terms of successful case resolutions. Workers who offer care in a culturally appropriate way have the following characteristics. They may be from the same ethnicity as the client or have experience working with a particular community. They are flexible willing to meet for the first time where the client is most comfortable, including in the home, and they're willing to assist with additional needs, for example, accessing immigration services, completing the medical assistance application, or checking on health insurance benefits. Providing culturally responsive care is not only the role of the worker, but it also means ensuring that referrals are culturally appropriate, in other words, following up with the client after a mental health referral and ensuring that the client feels comfortable and that the services are culturally appropriate. These are quotes that describe culturally responsive care. Please take a moment to read these quotes. As mentioned before, the survey also asked respondents to describe why they thought referrals were successful. Reasons given for why providers felt that referrals were successful emphasize these areas, provider flexibility, collaborative care, trust, and cultural responsiveness and appropriateness of services. In this section, we will describe the barriers to successful referrals. This section describes barriers a refugee family may face in accessing mental health or other services that child welfare workers assisting a family to connect to these services may have to help to resolve. We're going to cover some that are particularly relevant for child welfare workers. Briefly, what is going on when mental health referrals don't work is that there is a lack of coordination of care providers are unwilling or unable to refer or accept the referral of a refugee or non-English speaking client, there are system barriers, interpreter barriers, 
or providers make inappropriate requests of ethnic community-based organization staff. Sometimes refugees are given referrals to general mental health care that they don't connect to through no fault of their own, but because the services are not culturally appropriate. Refugees may voluntarily not engage with mental health services for many reasons. These could include that they find the services culturally inappropriate, that the recommended treatment conflicts with refugees' religious beliefs, the refugee lacks knowledge about the mental health referral or the mental health process or system. It makes sense that child welfare workers spend time educating families about mental health and inquiring about the appropriateness of the referrals that they've made. Here again, you can access the healthcare system navigators for assistance. This is a great example shared by a mental health agency staff about how refugees may lack knowledge about the mental health referral process. It says, many of our clients don't know what resources are available to them, so they don't know how to use existing resources, while others don't fully understand how a particular resource can help. Many times, they're very concerned that accessing services will incur debt that they will not be able to pay. Other clients don't know what will happen to the information that they share with providers and are concerned about privacy or negative impact of giving out too much information. It is very important for child welfare workers making referrals to find out how familiar a client is with Western systems and mental health services. If the client is not familiar, it is important for child welfare workers to provide information about each step of the process, ensuring the client understands and anticipating and answering questions along the way. This will also assist with trust and rapport building with a family. These are examples of things that could go wrong when there is a lack of coordination support for refugees in mental health referrals. These are all areas that child welfare workers making referrals may be involved or may request assistance from health plan staff. Examples of things that go wrong include miscommunication or lack of communication between providers or with clients, mental health providers not contacting refugees referred to them in a timely manner, crisis and emergency mental health services not providing adequate care or establishing appropriate aftercare, health insurance not covering medical transportation, Clients not being able to use their health plan's transportation benefit, for example, not knowing how to take the bus or being too scared to take the bus. Medical transportation not arriving when requested. Mental health providers refusing to assist with arranging transportation for the mental health appointment, for example, saying things like, I don't do that kind of work. Mental health providers refusing to work with a non-English speaking client. And finally, interpreter barriers. This quote is an example of a coordination barrier. I think the client did call her insurance and they did offer her a bus ticket, but because of her illness and her fear that something would happen to her, which is part of her symptoms, and not knowing the transportation system, it made her not want to use the transportation. Transportation is a key component to a successful mental health referral. It is important for child welfare workers to check with a family to see whether they have transportation for any appointment that is made. Other things that a child welfare might do is call a provider to see if they have set up transportation for the appointment or if they're willing to set up transportation for the mental health appointment or calling the client's health plan to request transportation for the client for the appointment. It might also involve helping the client to identify another mode of transportation so that they can get to their mental health appointments. Interpreter barriers was the number one reason given why mental health referrals were unsuccessful. Remember that non-English speaking patients have a right to an interpreter if they are seeing a provider who accepts Medicare or other federal funding. Interpreters for mental health appointments should be covered by the client's health plan. It may be helpful for the child welfare worker to call the provider to ensure that a professional interpreter is scheduled for the mental health appointment. Here again, this is an example of active coordination of care. This quote is an example of an interpreter barrier. 
It was given by an ethnic community-based organization staff who was trying to refer a client for mental health crisis services. Quote, adult mental health crisis worker said she did not call the client about the missed appointment because, quote, I do not speak his language, so I can't call him, end quote. This is an example of a time when a child welfare worker could offer advocacy and assistance to a refugee family to ensure that they can receive appropriate care. ECBOs, again, are ethnic community-based organizations. These organizations have cultural and linguistic capacity to serve refugees from their community, and as a result, are often used inappropriately by mainstream organizations who do not understand the role of ECBOs. These are examples of the types of inappropriate requests that are made of ECBO staff. It is important for child welfare workers, as well as other mainstream providers, to understand the role of ECBOs and how to provide culturally responsive care, which may include utilizing professional interpreters rather than ECBO staff. Inappropriate requests of ECBOs could include asking them to coordinate interpretation and transportation, asking them to communicate with a client on behalf of the provider, asking them to host appointments in their office, or request to interpret for appointments. ECBO staff can be an excellent resource for a new refugee family, but it is important for workers to understand their role so as not to make requests for assistance that are outside the realm of expertise of the ECBO or outside their available services. Reasons given for why providers felt referrals were unsuccessful added more around the notion of providers being dismissive, clients not understanding the mental health treatment or not trusting providers, and providers not arranging interpretation, transportation, providing culturally appropriate services, or following up. Referrals are not successful when clinicians were not trained and care was not culturally appropriate. When working with refugee families, child welfare workers may need to play a more active role in coordination, client advocacy, and follow-up, which will help ensure that families are able to receive the services and the help that they need. In this last section, we offer recommendations for child welfare workers, as well as additional resources. Reasons given for why providers felt referrals were unsuccessful added more around the notion of providers being dismissive of the needs of refugee families, clients not understanding the mental health treatment or not trusting providers, and providers not arranging interpretation, transportation, providing culturally appropriate services, or following up. When working with refugee families, child welfare workers may need to play a more active role in coordination, client advocacy, and follow-up which will help to ensure that refugee families are able to receive the services and the help that they need. Part 5, Recommendations and Resources. This slide contains six recommendations for child welfare workers who are working with refugee families. First, assist families to resolve resettlement stressors, for example, filling out paperwork, or assistance in finding safe and secure housing. These are issues that may be creating instability within the family. Without resolution of these more immediate needs, families may find it difficult to focus on other areas. Second, play a more active role in connecting families to services. Offer case management, advocacy, accompaniment, and follow-up to assist families in accessing resources. Third, frame mental health referrals using the symptoms that they have described. For example, if a client has described difficulty sleeping, too many worries, or thinking too much, explain that there is help available for these symptoms. Then, when you make the referral, describe the symptoms for which you are making the referral to the provider to facilitate coordination of care. Avoid using the broad term mental health as it may not be easily translatable and may be interpreted as crazy or another stigmatizing term. Fourth, provide plenty of information about the process. 
Families may not know or may not be familiar with the resources that are available to them, or they may have questions or misconceptions about the process, for example, that to obtain services might cost them money. Additionally, providing plenty of information about your work with a family will also help build trust and rapport and correct fears and misconceptions. Be familiar with the family's culture and common refugee experiences of people from their background. This will also help you build trust and rapport and prepare you to provide culturally responsive care. Finally, be knowledgeable about culturally relevant resources. The more you can be familiar with the culturally relevant resources that are available, the more prepared you will be to serve refugee families and the more help you will be able to provide. The first two links on this page are resources compiled by the Minnesota Department of Health Refugee Health Program. They were created to be a quick reference for individuals working to identify appropriate community-based agencies that serve Minnesota's many diverse communities. Please pause this presentation and take a few minutes to familiarize yourself with the information that is available from each of these resources. This completes the 2014 Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare Learning Module titled Making Successful Mental Health Referrals for Refugee Families, Rights, Barriers, and Resources.